Welcome back everyone. I'm Danny and this is the Stock Car Surplus YouTube channel. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about a bunch of different rears and they are not the ones you're thinking of. We're gonna go over the differences in housings, how to measure their overall width, how to read all of the dimensions either engraved or written on the inside of the housing, how to measure for axles, because believe it or not, the right axle is different than the left. We're gonna go over all of that and I've already picked out a housing for the Supra. We're gonna take it outside, we're gonna clean it, we're going to buff it down with some Scotch-Brite, put a fresh coat of paint on it. We're going to assemble it with axles, the rear gear and pump, hubs, rotors, and hats, get it hung on our truck arms, and back under the Supra by the end of this episode. Stick around, guys. I hope you learned something today. This is the housing we're going to use on our Supra Track Day project. This housing originally came from Red Bull. I acquired it from a clean-out at BK Racing when they shut down. The housing is straight, it is a road course housing, and I'll show you the measurements on it now. It's kind of hard to read, and a little bit of a pain in the butt, but this is a 61 inch road course housing. 1.80 negative camber on the left, 1.5 on the right. It's got 125 thousandths of toe. The pinion is down three and a half degrees, and the truck arm pad is set at 12 and a half. I know it's kind of hard to read there. I'll try and get you a better picture of that. And I'll show you on a couple of other housings that I have, how to read those dimensions and what they mean. All right, let's roll this thing outside and get it cleaned up. Basically what I'm doing is using a heavy grit Scotch-Brite to knock all of the surface crud and crap, a little bit of surface rust that's on there, a little bit of oxidation. And given the coating and paint that's on here, giving it some tooth by roughing it up so that the paint that I'm gonna put on it sticks. I also used a 3M Scotch-Brite wheel on a four inch DeWalt cordless to take down any of the heavy spots, but I think this will do it. I'll clean it up real good. Spray it down with some SD20 and some acetone. And then we can put some paint on it. I'll have to grab some caps and plugs, and a cardboard cover for the housing base to keep any paint from getting inside of it. So yesterday I tried to paint this thing, but after I got done cleaning it, the temperature plummeted to about 38 degrees. Today we're mid 60s. We're gonna put a coat of paint on this thing. We'll get it inside. We'll go over some of the numbers. I'll explain what those are, and then we'll get into measuring the housing.
Okay guys, now that our nine inch housing has been cleaned, prepped and painted, it's ready for reassembly. Behind me on the bench, I have all of the components that I've chosen to use on the Supra build. I'm gonna go over those components with you and I'm gonna show you everything I plan on using to complete it from axle cap to axle cap and everything in between. Let's take a look at those parts now. These are the rear hubs that I plan on using for our track day build. These are from NTN, they're a matched set. They've been rim polished and cleaned and I've repacked the wheel bearings that are in them with Mobile One synthetic grease. The difference with these hubs is that they use an aluminum flange and a double O-ring inside there to keep the grease in versus your older style wiper seal that just had a rubber flap on it. The big difference between these is they're held in with a snap ring versus the other one that's just pressed in and most people beat in with a hammer. This goes right in with a snap ring. I've never had one of these fail. Both hubs come with ARP studs. Like I said, they've been packed with grease already and they have a machine flange for an O-ring to seal the wheel bearing grease from getting to our drive flange. Our drive flange also has a seals it pressed into it along with a seal on our axle cap. This helps keep all of the gear oil away from the drive flange and out of the hub and all of the hub grease in the flange itself. These are the hub nuts I plan on using. They use a spacer. This spacer is conical to fit the nut, and this will actually move a little with the wheel bearing. It has a locking tab on the outside that's held in place with twin 1032 screws. Once this is screwed down and locked into place on your axle tube, this actual flange bolts to the nut. It has a tab to lock it on the tube, and you torque it down these 1032s and this can't back off. Some of your older hubs and a lot of people use this N11 style nut. They'll hammer this poor thing to death with a chisel to get it on. They'll tighten it as tight as they can get because they don't want it to fall off during the race and then they'll bend that tab over. The unfortunate part about using these, especially today with so many options, is that people just beat the crap out of the corners of them and then it become harder and harder to get on or off. And then they start bending the tangs over on the locking tab. And before you know it, the tang will slip in and out of the groove. You'll get pieces of metal in your hub and it'll destroy your bearing. This works. It's not something that I use, but it's still available option. The third option, which I have a couple sets of these, these use a snap ring to lock it in place. Once again, you have your conical spacer, your actual nut goes on the tube. In that nut, you have a ring that locks it in place. One will lock into the actual nut. The other one will lock into your axle tube and your snap ring will pop right in, lock everything into place. There we go. And as you can see, this one's marked left thread. This one's left-handed thread. And the other one is right-handed. Let's move over to the housing and get some of these components installed. All right, guys, first thing we're going to do is we're going to install our hubs. Let's get to it. Put our conical spacer in. The nut. Let me grab my pin wrench. This is called a pin wrench. I use this to lock down my axle tube nuts. One of the other things I like about using this ring is that 
your bolt holes may not always line up with the locking tab on the tube. So in this case, if the tab was on this way, our bolts would be in the middle of the locking grooves. But if you flip it over, as you can see, we'll get a positive lock left and right here to prevent our ring from moving. And our tab is fully seated inside the axle tube. Now we'll just lock it down with these 1032s. Now that that's seated nice and flush, hub spins freely. Now we can measure for axles and put our drive plates on. Now that we have the hubs on our housing, let's take a look at the numbers on this thing. I've written them down on the inside of this cover. It says that we have a 61 inch housing, our left camber is 1.80, our right is 1.50, and the pad, which is going to be our truck arm mounting pad, is mounted at 12 and a half degrees, and the toe is negative 125 thousandths, it's an eighth of an inch. Where do these numbers come from and what do they mean? Let's take a look at that. Pretty simple, we're gonna jump in and figure out where is that 61 inch and what does that mean? That means the housing is centered, so our pinion is centered on a 61 inch wide housing. Now, how wide is the housing and where do you figure out that number? Let me show you. Most people think that you throw the housing together and you measure it, that's only 59. You'll need to install your drive flanges on each end to figure out exactly what the width of your housing is. So we'll stick the left one on, we'll put the right one on, and we'll measure it again. As you can see now, we're right at 61. That's where you get your width of your housing from. Now, as far as the camber numbers, let's take a look at that. Our sheet has the numbers written down from the inside of our housing. Pretty simple. It says on the left side, we're going to have 1.80 degrees. And we've settled at 1.70. For with the difference in the floor not being level and this not being on a surface plate, I'm pretty happy with that number. Let's check the right side. Our right side is supposed to come in at 1.50, and it does. Typically, you'll find all of these numbers on the inside of your housing like that. Now that we've figured all that out, let's measure for axles. Okay, guys, let's go over floater axles. This is a common question I receive from a lot of people. They've either just picked up a new rolling chassis stock car, or they're building one from a bare chassis. The common question I get is I need a set of floater axles for my rear housing. Do you have any? In response to that question, I'll ask the person, well, how wide do you need a left and right axle because they are different lengths? Commonly, the response I get is either no answer at all or typically I don't know. And that, that happens. It's common, happens to all of us. If you're new to something and you don't know, that's why you're here watching now. This is an easy thing to measure, and there are a lot of common tools out there, like this Ford 9-inch housing jig. You can buy these on Amazon and eBay. Pretty cheap. I picked this one up from a race team more than 10 years ago, and I've used it 100 times at least. It's a great tool. You can pick one up for under $30. All you have to do is look on the internet. I'm going to stick this one on our housing and show you how we use it. Let's get started. Okay, guys, once you pick up one of these jigs, you stick it on your rear housing. It's pretty simple to read. Typically, there's a D for driver side and a P for passenger side. This shows where your pinion center line is, and typically this hole is the center line of your pinion moving forward. For driveline angle, you can put a string in here and run it up to your transmission to find your driveline angle. Also, this hole right here, this hole is very important. It says axle end. You're gonna measure from here to the end all the way out, either left or right, of your axle tube to the end of the drive flange. So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to take a tape measure and we are going to measure from the edge here to the face of our drive flange here with a tape measure. 
That's going to give us our left axle length. Then we'll do the same thing on the right. We'll put the tape measure here. We'll measure all the way out the end of the right tube to the face of the drive flange, and that will give us our right axle length. Let's get started. All right, first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna insert the tape through the axle tube into the center section of the housing. I'll turn that around right there. And what I'll do is I'll clamp it in place so it doesn't fall off or move. Then we'll come around this side and we will measure right here. And we are going to use an axle that is 27 and three quarters of an inch in length. Let's move around and do the right side. Come right back here, pull the clamp off, pull the tape out, run the tape to the right side. Once it gets into the housing, we'll clamp it in place. Clamp on the bottom. Then we'll come over here. Once I get this camera in place, we can see that this is a 32 and an eighth, typically a 32. So we'll go with a 32 inch axle here and a 27 and three quarter on the other side. Now let's measure out our axles. <clears throat> These are the axles that we're gonna use in our Supra project. This one is 32 inches on the top. The one for the left is 27 and three quarter. And this one on the bottom is 26 and three quarters. These are 31 spline that go into the center section for our Detroit locker. Those are crown cut on the end for easy engagement in our drive plate. When used on a road course housing, that crown cut gear allows for full spline engagement because of the camber built into our housing for better cornering. When this is installed on the axle and it's in your car, it will lock in place and allows for that misalignment of up to three degrees. This is what we're gonna use on our super. Let's get this stuff installed. Now that we've got both axles installed, you can see how they line up exactly with our open end for our locker. I'll use a screwdriver to show how the end of each axle lines up right there. Lines up squarely with the end of the opening on our gauge. Now, why is this important? This is important because this is called a floater axle. Like it says, it floats. It'll move left, it'll move right. What we need to do is keep that gap consistent. So what we'll end up doing, we'll take some of these bolts, we'll take two fine thread bolts, I'll put them in the lathe and I'll put a crown cut on them and I'll cut the end of them so that it's rounded, kind of like it says, like a crown, so that only the very center of the two bolts touch each other and they keep the axles engaged. The reason this is important is because in the center of our housing, there are no teeth in your Detroit locker in that inch and an eighth gap in the middle. So you wanna keep this full inch and a half of spline engaged in your locker, and you wanna keep the axle from sliding all the way in and hitting the next axle. Ultimately, what that'll end up doing is when it pulls all the way in like this, you will lose engagement in your drive flange and it can round off the teeth and break. Once that happens, your track day or race day is completely over. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take two of these, we're gonna put them in the lathe, we're gonna turn the end down, and we're gonna crown cut them. Then we'll put them back in here with some washers and Loctite and hold them in place. All right, we're gonna turn two of these down and put a crown on them. I'm going to use this little lathe I got from my good friend, Mr. Rock Hill Will Cronkite. And we'll lock this down in place. Got my cutting bit on there. Back it up. I use this little mini lathe. A lot of people give these things a whole bunch of crap on the internet. But they are perfect for making control arm spacers, engine spacers, turning stuff down trimming the shoulder on a control arm spacer. I mean, these things are perfect for that. 
They're not super accurate. I wouldn't do any precision machining with it, but if you need to take a little bit off of something or eyeball it, this is definitely a good investment. There's one, there's two. Now I'm gonna take a Scotch-Brite disc. I'm gonna buff that down on the top there a little bit. These will be perfect for what we're doing with our axles. Now that I buffed the heads down, we can install each of these, one in the left and one in the right axle, and we'll see what kind of clearance we have in the middle. Now we still have a small gap there, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull one out and throw a washer in it. Once I do that, we'll see where our clearance is at. These are some hardened black oxide washers from ARP. I'm gonna install one on the left side first, then we'll check it again. I think we'll add one on the right side and we'll be perfect. As you can see, that gives me the clearance I need right in the middle. Now you don't want these touching to where they're locked in place when you put your axle caps on. You actually want a little bit of clearance in there. I typically put an eighth inch and the reason that I would put an eighth inch in there is because believe it or not your actual your tubes they will flex and they will move so any movement you get will be taken up by that eighth inch in there and it will keep the axles from binding together and locking together. The other thing you need to keep in mind is that you want at least an inch and a half worth of spline to engage your locker. Next thing we're gonna do, now that we've got our, our spacer bolts made and they're crown cut, we're gonna slide the axles back some and we're gonna grease the axles. XHP 222, that's extreme high pressure. This is good stuff. I'm gonna put it just on the splines of our inner axle shaft where this is going to engage our locker. Now this locker doesn't have clutches in it. It's a mechanical locker with springs. It's a Detroit. Many of you may or may not be familiar with that style. So we're gonna put a liberal amount of grease on here. I'm gonna grease both sides. And once I get this on, I'll slide this back all the way to my inner axle seal, but I won't pull it through the inner axle seal. And I'll show you where that seal's at. And then what we're going to do is we're gonna put some Molly synthetic spline lube on the drive plates. So we'll close that up and slide these back to there. That way I can get my center section in. This is what an inner axle seal is. It's dual seals. Your axle shaft slides through it, sits here in the tube, and it keeps all of the oil, the gear lube, in the center section circulating through the pump to keep it cool. It prevents it from going out each side to your actual hubs and then spilling grease out of the hub tube. Even though we have seals out there, we seal up the inside as well. I'll show you what that looks like. That is our left inner axle seal. And there is the other one. Now what I have, this is from Neo. This is some synthetic spline lube. It's pretty sticky stuff. I recommend, highly recommend using gloves when installing this stuff. What I'm gonna do now is coat the 24 splines that engage our drive flange. So we'll just take this stuff, put it in here. This is for extreme high pressure and it's designed specifically for splines. And it's made by Neo Synthetics. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna coat both of these on both sides and these will sit here while I put my gasket on the center section and install the third member. Let's move over to the other side. 
Here we are on the left side. This is actually the driver side, and we're gonna go ahead and coat this liberally as well. Get this down into the splines. So when I slide it in, it actually coats my drive flange, my drive plate really well. This stuff's actually pretty expensive. That's why it's sold in such a small container. But it's made by Neo Synthetics, and you can find it online. Let's get our third member prepped. Let's get some gasket sealer, and then we can seal this thing up. Uh, right here. We are going to use, uh, let's see. No, not that. I temp RTV. There we go. We'll use that. Oh, that one's hard as a rock. That one's garbage. Oh, there we go. What I'm doing now is installing some gasket maker. I'll spread this around a little bit. Install our gasket. Once I get the gasket on here, let's set up for a few moments. I'll stick our third member in the housing. And we'll get this thing together. Now, a lot of people may think this is overkill, but I have tried on several occasions to use just a gasket. I've used many brands, Felpro, Cometic, Roll, and I have never in my life had just a gasket seal and keep gear oil from leaking. I'm sure some people in the comments are going to say they have, but in all my years, I have never had a 9-inch Ford go together without using some form of RTV to get it to seal. Sweet. Let's wipe this down, get the excess off of it. And we'll be ready for a third member. Once I put the third member on, start tightening it down. This is going to squeeze out everywhere, but it is what it is. And I'll clean that up accordingly once we torque it down. This is the gear assembly we're going with. This is a Mark Williams center section, as you can see. It's got a billet yoke in it. It's got Tex straps on it. Safety wire Daytona pinion support. Lightened and polished 400 gear. It's been rim polished and it's got a mid valley internal gear pump on it. This is what we're going to use with a Detroit locker in our track day build. So let's get this thing in there. We're using hardened washers and nylon lock nuts to hold it in. Get a little bit of brake cleaner and a rag, and we'll wipe around, get all the excess silicone off of it. Slide the axles in, put our axle caps on.
Up next, we're gonna pull all of the caps off the housing that we had for painting. We're gonna install our drain plugs and safety wire them. We're gonna install them with some pipe sealant to keep them from leaking. This is a magnetic drain plug. I highly recommend one. Now this drain plug will actually go in where there was a heater probe. Some teams would heat the gear oil prior to qualifying. And at one time it was illegal to do so. And I've even seen a rear end gear cooler pump set up that actually had a temperature probe in the housing that you could not find unless you were looking for it, which I thought was pretty cool. That was shown to me by someone I know very well. So we'll tighten these up, the safety wire. I'm not going to seal this one yet because we haven't got any gear oil in it, so I'm just going to put this in hand. All right, guys, at the beginning of this video, I said we were going to go over some rears. Behind me, I've got two racks full of them. There are a bunch of different housing on these racks. We're going to go over the differences between a short track, super speedway, and a road course housing, what the numbers on them mean, the differences in camber, and their applications. Let's take a look at what we got behind us now. Okay, guys, I've got two different racks here. On the right, these are 58 and 60 inch housings for Gen 4 cup cars and bush cars and truck series housings. On the left, these are 61 inch Gen 5, Gen 6, and Xfinity car COT chassis housings. There's a big difference between the two in width, and the older car has a one inch narrower truck arm pad width. That's something to keep in mind when you buy housings. These housings here are all COT housings. The one on the top is kind of extreme. It's an MWR short track housing. If you can see, it has three degrees of negative camber on the right side. That would be the passenger side. You can see it's kind of hard to pick up in video, but you can see that this tube is facing up. There's three degrees where the top of this is leaning in at the top. And as we move to the driver's side, if you take a look here, you can see how the tube is pointing down. That's three and a half degrees of positive camber, which means the top of the tire is actually leaning out. That's a short track housing. This road course housing here marked 55, that came from MWR. That is an exact copy of the road course housing that's going in the Supra. Below it, that's a short track housing that came out of it. Behind it, I have one, two, those are a zero camber Hendrick housing. That's a Hendrick road course housing. On the bottom, that's a Red Bull Super Speedway housing with zero camber in it. And this on top is another MWR road course housing. Now some housings, they will weld the brake bracket onto the housing versus using a bolt-on bracket such as this. On the narrower housings, as I was talking about, as you can see, this is a 60 inch road course housing. Two degrees negative left and right. The toe is 15 thousandths. Now this is 60 inches wide. And the big difference you have to remember with the older Gen 4 cup cars 
is that this mounting pad is one inch narrower than what you would see on the Xfinity, Gen 5, and Gen 6 cars. This, even though it has a KBM tag on it, is actually a Roush road course housing from a Carl Edwards car. This one actually has two and a half degrees camber left and right in it. But this one also uses lower reinforcements. These bolt to the bottom of your truck arm, and this reinforcement bar runs to the bottom of the housing. Several teams have done several different things with the housings over the years. That's just one of them. This is another zero camber housing. That's another zero camber housing behind it. There's a Roush road course housing. And this one came from Junior Motorsports as well. So that's just some of the differences in the housings and what they look like. Let's go to the whiteboard and I will give you a better drawn out explanation. Okay guys, time for some talk on the whiteboard. This is a horribly drawn explanation of the difference between the housings and what I talk about degrees of camber. This is what I mean by negative camber on both your left and right tire in a road course housing. The tires are both leaned in at the top and this gives for the optimal contact patch in both left and right turns and cornering on a road course. This is what your typical short track housing looks like. Positive camber on the left, negative on the right. Both tires are leaned to the left. And that's because it gives the best contact patch on a short track with banking. Super Speedway housings. Typically on the left, they have half a degree or less in camber. That's positive camber. On the right, they typically run one degree to one and a half degrees of negative camber. The reason being is that the arc of a super speedway turn is so broad that the amount of camber needed is a lot less than a short track. Even though the turns are much higher in banking and steeper, the actual radius of the turn allows for less camber. The reason that they run less camber in the left tire is it allows for the optimal contact patch down the long straightaways and through the triovals a day Daytona and Talladega. Now, depending on what you want to do, you can choose a housing. If you're a hardcore road racer and you just want a track day car that's going to run on road courses, definitely look for a road course housing. But if you've bought a car with a super speedway housing, don't rule out keeping it, especially if it's less than half a degree of camber. That half a degree of camber can be overcome with tire pressure. Now, if you have a short track housing, with a gross amount of negative and positive camber in the housing, you really need to think about what you're going to do with it. Is this going to be some type of parade car where you go up and down the road and parades, Shriners Parade, Boy Scouts, that kind of thing? Or is this going to be like a charity lap, parade lap car where you drive 55 miles an hour around Darlington or Rockingham or something of that nature? Then this would be fine to leave in your car. But if you do choose to make it a full-on track day car and road race it, I would highly suggest that you look for the correct width and camber road course housing for your application. Time to stick some brakes on this thing. Believe it or not, the calipers, rotors, and hats that came off that short track housing actually came back as a good short track road course setup. I pulled them apart, cleaned them. I pulled the pistons out of the caliper and looked at them. It appears they've never been run. All of the pistons still had the original assembly grease in them and no brake fluid at all. I wiped them down, reassembled them, and we're gonna stick everything on our road course housing. We're gonna go through how to install the rotor, center the caliper, and get everything bolted on. Once I have the calipers and rotors on this housing, we're gonna put it on our teardown cart, slide it under the car, mount it to our truck arms, and get it hanging from the back of the car. Let's get to it. Okay guys, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna install our brake bracket. This holds our caliper to the housing. It utilizes grade eight hardware and a set of adapter bushings. These bushings go into our brake bracket like this. And then we're gonna use grade eight Bowman fine thread bolts. The bolts will go in like this. Everything I'm using uses an ARP hardened washer. Always use hardened washers on brake or suspension components. Then we'll slide our bracket on. This is our left bracket. The left bracket slides on. We'll put on our hardened washers. And then we're gonna use ARP hardened bolts. These are 12 point head. 
I'll thread these on. Then we'll put some Loctite on the threads. We'll run the bolt down the rest of the way. And now we can torque them in place. Up next, we'll install the rotor. Now we can stick our left rotor on and then check caliper fitment. I'm just gonna stick it on and hold it down with a couple of lugs real quick. Check my caliper fitment and see if it's centered. All right. And my caliper won't actually go on because it's actually hitting right there. So that means we need a rotor spacer. So let's pull this back apart and we'll stick a rotor spacer on there. Your rotor spacer is typically an aluminum spacer with notches in it for your rotor bolts to hold it to the hub. Your steel wheel spacer should only be used on the outside. It's a larger diameter and what that does is it will interfere with the hat and you won't be able to get the hat fully seated onto the hub. So your rotor spacer is gonna be smaller, typically made out of aluminum, and it'll be notched for your hub bolts to hold the rotor on. Now our caliper fits, but it hits the rotor. So what we'll have to do now is we'll have to put a hardened washer behind the rotor to raise the caliper so that the actual rotor vein does not hit the inside of your caliper here. So let's stick some washers on there. Now that we know the caliper actually hits the rotor, we're gonna install some hardened washers onto our brake caliper mount. Now you want to make sure that these are tight. You don't want washers that go on there and you've got some big floppy loose washer that just beats all around like that. It needs to be tight on this shaft so that it limits movement of the caliper. Now we'll install our caliper. We'll bolt it down into its fixed position and we'll check clearance to the rotor. Now it turns freely, and I can see that I have about 125 thousandths, which is an eighth of an inch in clearance, which is more than enough. This rotor and overall diameter, this rotor is not going to grow large enough to need that much clearance. I do have a set of brake pads on order for the front and the rear, and they are a match set from Brembo to go with a set of six piston Brembo calipers that are going to go on the front, and these have the quick change pad option. Let's move over and do the right side. Same thing here, we're gonna put our bushing in. Our grade eight bolt with a hardened washer. Our caliper mount, RT right side. We'll install that. Put our hardened washer on. Stick our ARP bolt on there. You grab my torque wrench. Next, we'll put a dab of Loctite on there. And then we'll lock it in place. Now, I already know that I needed a rotor spacer on the left side. So I'm going to go ahead and install one on the right side. And like I was saying with a wheel spacer, you can see rotor spacers are made to fit the exact diameter of your hub so that it doesn't interfere with the back of your rotor. Now that we have our rotor in place, we'll slide our caliper on. Like I said, it hits the rotor right there. So we'll pull it back off. And I'll go ahead and install two more hardened washers. We'll stick our caliper back on. We'll check for clearance, which we have plenty of now. Now we'll put our jet nuts on it and tighten it down. And these actually get torqued to 45 foot-pounds. I swear GoPro batteries overheat and die at the most opportune times. So I've got the rear end complete assembly on my teardown cart ready to roll back underneath the car. 
I used my engine hoist over here to get it off the assembly cart and onto this one. Unfortunately, the battery died and it didn't record anything. We're gonna roll it under the car. We're gonna hook up our truck arms to the front of the chassis first. We'll get the rear end underneath here. Once we do, we'll stick the U-bolts through it. We'll raise it up. Once we get it raised up, we'll put our limiting chains on and install our track bar and we'll be done for the night. Let's get to it. Now the U-bolts are through the truck arm and around the housing and the nuts are finger tight. We're going to hook it up using the limiting straps to the chassis here. So we'll raise it up with a floor jack. We'll take this chain, hook it through that detent pin. Then we can tighten our U-bolts and get our track bar in and then we're done for the night. Last but certainly not least tonight, we are going to install our track bar. Now, as far as squaring the rear end housing, setting the track bar height and squaring the housing, I can't do any of that until I get the car fully built. I actually get it on scales, get the weight, have the right springs in it and make my adjustments. So for now, I'm just installing the track bar to keep the rear end from shifting in the car. All right, guys, that is a wrap on today's episode. I think we pretty well covered everything there is that goes inside a nine inch floater housing and how they're assembled. If you learned something today, drop a comment below. Let me know. I would greatly appreciate it. And if you would subscribe, according to the analytics, 82% of you that watch our videos aren't subscribed. I would greatly appreciate it if you did. Our housings hung back in the car. We reused the brakes, saved us some money. Tomorrow, I'm picking up the fuel cell and springs for the front and rear, but I'm going to hold off on putting them in as well as gear oil in our housing. Up next, we're going to hang our Peterson dry sump tank, and I've already TIG welded some stainless lines together to run from the rear of the car to the front. I've got to go by and pick up a few hoses as well. I've got them ordered. All that's going to be in the next episode. We're going to stick a fuel cell in it. We're going to hang the dry sump tank. I'm going to show you how it goes together, all the baffles that are inside of it, as well as the heating probes and the temperature probe. That's going to be in the next episode. Thanks for watching, guys. Can't wait to see you next time.